Welcome to Beyond the Reiki Gateway, a podcast reserved for the spiritually curious. Journey further with Reiki Masters Kathleen Johnson and Andrea Kennedy through in-depth conversations, many featuring inspiring and intriguing special guests to enrich your unique spiritual progression. We welcome you to another episode of Beyond the Reiki Gateway, and I'm here today with my co-host Kathleen Johnson and a very special guest, Dave Markowitz. And Dave is a two-time best-selling author, intuitive healing facilitator, and guide for empaths, sensitives, and intuitives. He shared the lecture bill with Deepak Chopra, and his work has been endorsed by Lee Harris, The Shift Network, Shirley MacLaine, Lynn Andrews, Danyan and Catherine Brinkley, and many more. Dave has worked with thousands of empaths and sensitives since his empathic awakening and leads experiential workshops where attendees can receive tangible results in just a few minutes. We are beyond excited here at the podcast, and Dave, we want to welcome you to the show. Thanks so much. Great to be here. We're very excited to have you here, Dave. Thanks for sharing your time and your knowledge with our audience. And as I was listening to Andrea tell us about you, one of the things that struck me right off the bat was an empathic awakening. (laughs) And okay, that's a term I've not heard before. So could you possibly expand upon that a little? And what exactly is an empathic awakening and how did it happen for you? Hopefully, many people get to experience that. Simply put, it's when you realize you're an empath. Oh, <laughs> makes sense. Prior to that moment, uh, it was really kind of interesting. It almost was like a scene out of a movie where I connected with a guy at a local meetup. And he just kept, look, kept looking at me and saying, y- you're an empath. And for whatever reason, I just didn't want to own the term. And that wasn't knowledgeable enough. Maybe my mind was just rejecting being labeled. That's, that's very likely also. And he just kept saying it. And finally, he said, you know, I'm the head of the Portland meetup for empaths. And I know one when I see one. (laughs) So I just said, okay, whatever. You know, I didn't look it up. I just, you know, okay, that's his perception of me. Beautiful. Nothing I can do or need to do. Just be with that. And that's fine. But the specific awakening was I was invited to a friend of a friend's birthday party. And I didn't know till I got there that it was a bar crawl. (laughs) <laughs> so they had set up to go to seven bars in seven hours. And I hadn't been in a bar in, at that point, probably a decade and a half, give or take. I really haven't drank in a really long time. As the chef from South Park likes to say, there's a time and place for everything, and it's called college. So <laughs> I feel like I did my share and, and don't need to anymore. But what was really interesting, I just drank water the entire evening. I was just kind of hanging out with people and wasn't thinking much of it. And at the end of the night, I went to hail a taxi cab and out of my mouth came something to the effect of, (laughs) and I had my hand up, you know, the universal get me a taxi kind of thing. And hearing myself say taxi, but I'm also hearing with my physical senses, you know, (laughs) this is a little bit odd. And then I finally got in the taxi and I had that, you know, that moment in, in also in a movie where like, all the lights go on. It's like, oh, you know, <laughs> I realized I felt drunk. And that's why I couldn't speak as clearly as I'd like to. This spirit just came in and said, This is what it means to be an empath. Welcome. Oh. And then it hit me, right? Empath, of course, takes on energy from other people and enough to change our own internal environment, whether it's mood or physiology, just kind of makes sense. And I had basically gotten drunk without drinking any alcohol. And when I got out of the cab, you know, I did all the tests, you know, like I kind of walk a straight line and it was as if I was drunk. So it was a great thing that I wasn't driving (laughs) because that would have been interesting, right? Acting drunk, but no alcohol in the body. Uh, I wonder if that would have passed the the sobriety test. Some of them maybe, but others probably not. You know, again, I didn't think that much of it until the very next day when I guess I should have proceeded by saying prior to this, I had a decent, uh, reasonably successful medical intuition practice, had a best-selling book. People would call me, I would say, okay, you're holding anger in your low back. And people say, oh, that makes sense. Okay, let's work with that. Great. Now, this next day, everything changed. I'm not just hearing you have anger in your low back. I'm hearing you have your dad's anger 
in your back. So I'm sure we've all had these moments where you say something and not really sure where it's coming from or the conscious mind. Sure. What's that about? And it just kept happening. And of course, the next question is, what do you do with that? So fortunately, being reasonably intuitive, I was able to tune in and get exercises in the moment of how to process these energies that were very different from what I'd been exposed to prior. And it kept happening to the point where I would really say a high 90% of the people that have come to me have had some sort of empathic absorption in their life and have been holding something for someone else. And that was what they call, in a lot, call the X factor. That was the missing ingredient for the healing practice. And it made a lot of sense. They were trying to work on things that were not their own, using tools that were made for things that are their own. So it's like using a screwdriver where you need a hammer or vice versa. You might get the job done, but it'll be a little messy. It'll take a lot longer. And I was able to intuit all these steps, all these processes of how to not just heal what was there in a whole different way, but also how to prevent that incoming energy from coming in. And I hadn't read any books about empaths. I didn't recognize the word, so I had no reason to in that moment. And what I found out later on was they were very different from the things most of us are taught who are aware of their empathic abilities or even just high sensitivities, where we typically learn things like how to block that incoming energy. And that makes sense, right? If something's coming your way, you don't want to experience it, it makes sense to block it. But I was shown in these meditations that that actually closes down your energy field. It is fear-based. And mm -hmm. fear, fear is good. I mean, fear can help you if a bus is coming at you. You need fear to help say, okay, I need to get out of the way. So you can't get rid of fear. But we can use it for the tool, you know, as a tool, how it's meant to be used. So I wasn't able to intuit ways of actually opening to what was coming in and really embracing it and really owning the empathic ability, which is much more in alignment with who empaths and sensitives are. And so anytime we can work more in alignment with who we truly are, of course, you're going to get better results. So I'm really teaching people, how do you be with incoming energy from a place of love and compassion, rather than from the place of, oh, get rid of that. I don't want that. This feels yucky. Well, yeah, it does. And if you work with it in an aligned way, you can get much better results. And I even found that putting up these walls decreases the person's ability to connect deeply, which is part of their superpower, right? It also creates more blockages. It actually makes us more susceptible to incoming energy because as we all know, what you fight gets more energy. The phrase, what you resist persists. It made a lot more sense. So it was interesting hearing what everyone else had been taught from my clients where I was teaching the new way and they would say, oh, of course, that makes much more sense. Thank you for sharing that. What I had learned was blank, you know, what I just described. And it was really common. So I think, oh, I must be onto something here. And then that really morphed into that first book, Self-Care for the Self-Aware, which was my first book specific to empaths and sensitives. And that became a bestseller. It's on Amazon's top 20 list for 41 consecutive months. And it was basically an unheard of number for a self-published book. Yeah. And I just want to jump in here, Dave, and say that book is a life changer. And I don't say that lightly. I found that book many years ago. And this HSP term, this highly sensitive person and empathic, these descriptions were a bit new to me. And I got this book and the techniques and the insights that you give in that. And it's a little book. And I have to admit, that makes it so much more special to me because I, I like little books, books that get to the point and give you what you need and give you tools. And that book checks all those boxes. And not only did it really help me, it helped me help my own clients in my Reiki practice. And I had that book of yours in my desk drawer. Certain clients would come and I'd think, oh, I got to tell them about Dave Markowitz's book. And I'll tell you, so effective. Some of them even went and had personal sessions with you. And so this is just a wonderful time for me to meet you here because I've seen this work actually work for people. And it's very, very exciting. I had one of my clients come in and she brought your book. And out of the book, 
all of these post-it notes. She had written all of these notes and, and aha moments, and she just was over the moon with it. I'm wondering, what I heard you talk about just then was actually two subjects. One is healing for empaths, what has already affected them. And then the second part of that would be dealing with the present moment and in the future, how then to deal with that. And I'm wondering if you could maybe expand a little bit about some of that guidance that you received about healing. Previously, we had tools that it was your own stuff that you're healing. Empaths, it's not even their stuff. And the other thing I have to say before, I can't wait for your answer. You called it a superpower. And I love that because so many people think it's a weakness and it isn't. It just isn't. So if you could talk a little bit more about that, that would just be great. Sure. I'd love to. Thanks for uh, inquiring and jumping into that. Just quickly about the superpower. I think when these abilities are misunderstood, misused, they will feel like a burden. Absolutely. But when we basically learn how to use them from an unskilled empath to a skilled empath, unskilled isn't insulting. It just means I don't know something yet. Right. So how do we go to the next level? So yeah, to me, it is a superpower when used well. I think interestingly, we all kind of know that already. We know that when we're holding space for others, others have a really great experience. The problem was others would walk away saying, wow, in this case, Andrea, wow, she's so awesome. And you might not be able to walk away from interaction because you've just took on all of their stuff. So becoming a skilled empath is really what I'm about. A lot of the tools are about that. More specifically on how to do the healing. When I first mentioned this, I think a lot of people might sort of jump up in their chair. So I'm going to ask everyone to put your seatbelt on for a second. Or better yet, actually take the seatbelt off. Let's, let's surrender to the moment. <laughs> all right. It's <laughs> such a common phrase, right? Put your seatbelt on. So it kind of makes sense if you really think about it beyond what we've conditioned ourselves to believe or and or more accurate, perhaps been conditioned to believe. So if we're the space holder, let's just say the, the walking sponge, at any point, if we got any accolades for doing so, in whatever form that might look like within our own selves or from other people around us, the ego identifies with that and says, oh, this is my job. This is who I am. And we typically go into the healing arts of any kind. I mean, a lot of things can be considered a healing art. So we want to be really conscious of how these things develop and take active steps on how to change that in a loving way and also how to heal things that have been absorbed. So first we have to understand it's not our job to hold anything for anyone else other than space. Holding a place of love and compassion will bring us very different experiences than doing the opposite. But doing to the point of actually holding people's energy creates blockages within our own selves. It's been highly responsible for things like depression, anxiety, chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia. In my experience, I'm not saying there aren't other possible factors, but a lot of it is from carrying other people's energies. And even just basic aches and pains, a lot of times it can be from carrying other people's energy too. So a lot of times we might go to a practitioner and they might say, well, let's just give it back to the universe. It knows what to do with it. And that's great. I can't argue with someone if they've gotten results, but I would challenge it to go a little bit beyond the obvious and say, well, what is the purpose of pain and illness? Is there a purpose? And as a medical intuitive, what I've been able to see over and over and over is basically a sign saying that you're doing something that's not in your best interest. Not that you're doing something wrong, but something that could be better. You're off the mark. Just a little bit. Interestingly, in archery, when you're off the mark, the term for it is the word sin. Right? It's an archery term originally years back. So we're just off the mark, but that doesn't make us wrong. You wouldn't tell someone they're wrong if they were off the mark in archery. You would just say, let's just adjust. It's so the same kind of thing with this. If the purpose of pain and illness is to wake us up, is to show us something, we can actually have gratitude for it and be with it and listen to the message that it's trying to show us rather than trying to fight it. In fact, like we said earlier, what you fight gets more energy. And this is one of the reasons why people have chronic conditions. I had back pain for 20 years because, partly because at least I fought it. I went to practitioner, practitioner, 
modality to modality. I kept fighting it. I don't want this. I want to get rid of this. I can't do what I used to do. This horrible, blah, you know, all these things. And I, and I get it in, in a big picture. That's minor compared to what a lot of people are dealing with. But of course, it was frustrating in and of itself. So if we look at that as the baseline, pain and illness is a message. We can really deep go into it. Now, it's a message with an opportunity to learn something to be a better version of ourselves. Now, how much is that going to happen if we go to a practitioner and they say, let me clear it for you with whatever modality, you know, again, not wrong or bad, and you walk out of there feeling great, but invariably it comes back. And the reason is because we didn't really dive into the, what I perceive as the causal level. What is this message showing me? Now, a lot of times it's very simple. It's showing people I work with that they're overly empathic or unskilled in their empathic abilities, and they better get skilled pretty quickly. And sometimes the message is that simple. And other times, of course, it could be a lot more. But when we just give it back to the universe, it knows what to do with it kind of mindset. I found you're really not addressing and not much less of a chance of learning something than if you actually go through the process. The process that I found most powerful, I call return to sender. This is the words that were I channeled. Later on, I realized there were many practices called that name, which I thought was really weird. <laughs> Maybe they should have been something more unique, but whatever. The idea is we need to give it back to who it belongs to without even going into the how. Part of doing that is the experience of giving it back to someone else teaches us that we don't need to hold it and that we can actually see in the process or feel or even hear that that person actually needs what we're giving back to them. So if I say something like, you need to give your anger back to your dad, a lot of people say, oh, no, I can't do that. Partly because they learned when they were younger, if I could take some anger from dad, I'll be safer. And this is just an example. So then, of course, if we say here, I'm going to give it back to dad, then the inner child goes into a place of fear and the body will react and it's not going to work. But when we do the process in the way that was shown to me, we find that not only does a person need it, they actually want that energy back, no matter how we in our human capacities label that energy, anger, fear, grief, whatever it is. These aren't bad things. These are things people need to feel whole. Healing is about wholeness. From wholeness, symptom relief is relatively easy. So just chasing symptoms has its place. I get it. Can't make it wrong. We've all had those moments where, like, ah, I just want to be out of pain. I get it. And there's also the deeper perspective that says this is here for a reason. And each time we give energy back to someone else, our body gets a visceral, tangible sense that this is a positive thing because in just sometimes in just a few minutes, it takes much longer to explain than actually to do. And sometimes in just a few minutes, people will feel lighter, more centered, more grounded, relieved. Just yesterday, someone said, I'm, I'm breathing better than I have in the last 30 years. And it was literally from a five-minute session, or part of the session anyway. So the results can be pretty quick. Now, granted, there are typically multiple layers. So it's not like, you know, you're going to heal something really deep and profound in a few minutes. I mean, just realistically, things are multi-layered. But it's a very important layer. And again, it teaches us to be more concerned with what is this trying to show me? And if we keep giving the energy back to other people, we keep feeling better, then your body gets that message on a much deeper level than it could just through words alone. And you know what? It's not my job to hold anything for anyone else. Not my job to hold dad's anger, or mom's grief, the fear of the collective unconscious, et cetera. Everyone needs what they need that actually helps them be more whole gives them more of a chance to do their work, whether they do or not, of course, we can't get attached to, but at least gives them a, a chance because you can't heal what you don't know about. So if you're holding something from someone else, they don't even know what they're here to deal with. I really look at it as, I mean, at first I said, oh, hell no, I'm not doing that. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so I can totally appreciate when people say I'm not ready for that. But eventually I was able to see exactly what I'm saying here. It was actually so powerful so beneficial that I was actually calling it a gift. You're giving someone a gift. And I know that sounds a little weird to someone who's just taken on this possibility for the first time. Again, let's stay with the example. Giving anger back to dad is a gift. Wait a minute, right? Giving sadness back to mother is a gift for her. Wait a minute. This makes no sense. I, I object. <laughs> okay. That's a great explanation, Dave. Thank you for that. And you mentioned fibromyalgia early on when you were speaking. 
And I read your blog about fibromyalgia yesterday, which I found incredibly interesting. I was uh, diagnosed with fibromyalgia 26 years ago. And everything you just said and everything I read in the blog resonates so deeply because what I've learned with fibromyalgia is what you said about people who are ultra responsible. Hello, that's me. <laughs> Always have to be the one, the go to, the go to individual, right? That's been me for as long as I can remember. And then also carrying others' energies because of that exaggerated sense of responsibility. But what I noticed, and I've noticed this with others who are empathic or highly sensitive, is that once they intentionally and consciously embark upon their healing journey, which, as we know, never ends, healing is a lifelong process. But once they intentionally do that and start utilizing tools like you talked about and everything else that's out there, the physical symptoms start to recede. That's what happened to me. Initially, it was quite a burden having fibromyalgia. In fact, I had to take an early retirement from my career because of it, because it was so debilitating at that time. And once I started working on myself, nowadays, I rarely have symptoms. Occasionally, I'll have a flare up. And when I do, I know I need to look, okay, whose who's water am I carrying now, <laughs> right? But it's so interesting to me. And I, I'm curious, can you talk a little bit about any work you have done with people who present with fibromyalgia or any one of these mystery diseases, as they're sometimes called? What you just said is probably more powerful than anything I can say. Like your firsthand experience can be really exciting to hear for a lot of people who have been struggling. Nothing against Western medicine. I want to be really clear with that. I really feel everything has its place. Everyone has their place. I think otherwise, pretty arrogant. When necessary, each modality, each system is going to have some benefit, I imagine. Ideally, I think we address all levels, whatever is possible, in whatever way is possible. For those that have come to me with that diagnosis, it's a lot of times of that good way you just said, a lifetime of feeling overly responsible, being the go-to, the caretaker, the nurturer. And this is also important. We want to be really conscious that doing these things aren't necessarily bad things in and of themselves. And if you're a caretaker, it doesn't mean you're doomed to get these symptoms. So let's just be clear there before we get people in place of fear. <laughs> what it means is there is hope and we can work with these things step by step, layer by layer, and use them, like you said, as indicators to change something in our life. So caring for others can be done from, let's just call it one of two places. Granted, there can be some middle ground, but just in general, I'm sure we've all heard the phrase, is it coming from fear or is it coming from love? Fear will also, to me, include the conditioned belief systems, which are not typically coming from a place of love. So you could say love and everything else, actually. And when we're doing things, whatever that might be, caring for someone else or washing the dishes, our internal energetic state is really important. So let's just go with the latter because it's a lot simpler and I think anyone can relate to it. If you're washing the dishes from a place of anger and there's this story in your head or in your bladder or wherever it might be that says, I wish I didn't need to do this or even more intense, that lazy bastard on the couch, <laughs> you know, why doesn't <laughs> he do the dishes once in a while or whatever, you get the idea. But what that does is from the internal perspective, it creates a lot of tightness constriction, anger, etc. And that's normal and not wrong or bad. But you can imagine if that's prolonged, your nervous system gets used to that, you would get an almost heightened, if not prolonged, fight or flight response from being in a place of fear for too long. Whereas the opposite, what if we were able to do dishes and just marvel? How lucky am I that I just turn this little lever and fresh water comes out? How lucky am I that I can squeeze this little bottle here and these studs start forming <laughs> and I can do this and I'm so appreciative. Now, granted, that might be extreme. I understand how that might be, you know, a bit much <laughs> for people, but you get the idea. 
And what happens in a lot of cases with people with advanced and or what some are calling mystery disease, they've been doing things that everyone else says is a good thing, but it's not in alignment with who they are. And their body is basically talking and saying, hey, wait a minute, it's time to change your perspective and or just stop doing what you've been doing. Right? In your case, you were kind of forced to do it, right? You're forced to retire from your career. That's a pretty powerful message. I'm so glad that you listened to that message and acted accordingly. But you can imagine some don't and they push through. And that's that type A mindset that we all grew up believing is the positive, beneficial, super wonderful thing. You know, type A is get things done. Well, they do, but they burn themselves out. And a lot of times it leads to pain and illness. And a lot of times that message from that pain and illness, whatever it looks like, wherever it's diagnosed, is very simple. Get out of the type A fear-based mindset. Type A says, I need to get this done because if I don't, then this is going to happen. And it's a simplification of the mindset, but you get the idea. It's not typically in the flow of life. It's not looking for inspired moments. It's a checklist. Got to get it done. Got to get it done. And I get it. Sometimes we just need to get things done. But even then, if we can bring a place of heart-centeredness into that, it's a challenge, but so what? Right? Like you said, the, the healing journey is lifelong. We might be learning this on our deathbeds. <laughs> I guess kind of was hope, but not the case, right? But <laughs> whatever it One is. Never knows, is. right? Exactly. So if we can change our perspective and or stand up for ourselves, sometimes it's teaching us boundaries. No, I don't want to do these dishes anymore, or at least not tonight or this week or whatever, you know. It can be challenging, especially if we've gotten some kind of accolade or validation from being the person who does these things, whether it's washing dishes or something much more profound, you know, like holding space for other people, done from a place of insecurity and fear is going to affect both people negatively. For me, this I understand the concept of you know, what you call mystery illness, idiopathic illness, but as a medical intuitive, it's pretty rare that that shows up like that. It always shows up for at least a high percentage of the time that there is a lesson here. Something needs to be learned or experienced or changed, shifted, modified, call it what you will. And again, we have the option at that point. Do we want to listen to the message or not? I feel like the universe is always calling us on our phones. And we look at the phone and say, I don't want to get that. And we let it go to voicemail. And then we don't even check the voicemail. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, I do know what you mean. <laughs> yes. So I think we should start listening to the calls. And they come. I I'm sure you know you've all had your moments. And I think most people have had some moments at least, maybe want more, and that's okay want those moments of divine guidance. I really don't think we're in this boat alone. I think we're really in it together. There's a co-creation that can happen at any time. It just takes our own surrender and say, okay, what is it here for me to experience rather than how do I micromanage this? How do I change this? How do I fight this is really what they're saying. Whereas what I've found through experience, I went in kicking and screaming and I still have my moments. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the ego is still there and still fully functional and doesn't like to say, oh, you know, just give up all your power. It's not about giving up all your power. It's but tuning into something with more wisdom. It's like reading a good book versus a crappy book. You know, why would you read the crappy book if the good one is available? But we're used to reading crappy books, so that's familiar. And we tend to want to stay with what's familiar rather than challenge ourselves. And a lot of people want to challenge themselves, but then when it gets to the, you know, what hits the fan kind of moment, then we say, oh, wait a minute, I didn't mean that much. Or I didn't mean that. <laughs> right. We call it forward. So in this place of, I like to call it co-creation with spirit, I really think anything is possible, including healing, but it does require a surrender to that wisdom and then acting upon that, ideally from a place of love rather than kicking and screaming. Of course. Yeah. As you intimated earlier, what we resist persists, right? I mean, you said it in a different way, but so true. Kicking and screaming doesn't get the job done, usually. What strikes me too is it seems like a real, it's a wake up call, you know, the symptoms and, and life not working well or flowing well. Definitely, I think serves as that wake up call. I didn't even mean to go there, but yeah, you use the phone analogy. So yeah, wake up call. And it is up to the individual to decide if they're going to wake up and go there and awareness. And I'm seeing this just everywhere I look these days, but it's to me, awareness is the key to so much of what we're doing here. 
in this lifetime. And as long as we're kind of sleepwalking through life, we'll just be trying to cope. And do we want to just cope with life or do we want to change our lives? I just think awareness is just so important in the process. Absolutely. If I could add on another word, willingness. Of course. Willingness to see what's there, but also to work with what's there. And a lot of times that work can be uncomfortable. Oh, yeah. And I'm sure we've all had these moments where we got new tools or went to an empowerment weekend and it felt great. Had Monday morning highs and the end of the week, right? The Friday night blues. Why is that? We don't often have the support that's necessary to really support our willingness. Someone says anything to bring us down. It's normal when you stick your neck out, someone wants to (laughs) push you down. A lot of us grew up with that. But I think it's really important also to look at this as the process as opposed to something to fight. You wouldn't appreciate freedom, energetic flow, health if we didn't have some experiences in the opposite of that first. And I think that's a big part of our process. And so part of that willingness to heal also involves not judging our own past. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you all can relate if you haven't said it yourself and or had people say it to you, I wish I had known about this 30 years ago. Of course. Oh, yes. But if we believe in perfection of the universe, and I totally do, I can't tell others what to believe. I really think everything happens on divine timing. That if that information was presented 30 years ago, you wouldn't have believed it. Kind of like my own brief encounter with this gentleman who kept saying you're an empath. I wasn't ready. Then the universe said, you are, you just don't know it. And we're going to show you in this extremely unlikely circumstance of you being in a bunch of bars that you haven't been in for years. And this is another (laughs) thing also, just a quick side note. How could any empath really like being in a bar? (laughs) I don't. I don't. (laughs) Not at all. (laughs) Sometimes we might go there to kind of drown out because the incoming energy is so intense. And I get that. I don't, I can't judge that, but I think we all know that's a temporary fix, a break block, if that. So you're going to wake up feeling worse and not really look at what's going on to begin with. So a lot of layers, the awareness that, and the willingness to see, but also the willingness to make changes. And that reminds me of one other thing maybe I can touch upon because. A lot of people I know or work with even at first, they're excited about having tools that feel right, that they want to use. They get excited. Sometimes they do them and sometimes they don't. Don't do something. It's an invitation to self-criticism, which of course we know it doesn't really help anybody. What I would say is recognize that that's a form of resistance going against what's been familiar. And if we can heal that resistance head on, then it creates space to then do the steps that we know. So real basic, someone wants to lose weight, they understand they need to eat differently and exercise a bit more. Pretty basic stuff, hard to argue. Of course, there's a bunch of other possibilities. Emotional state is very important. Reason why someone perhaps overate, that wound needs to be addressed for any kind of permanent change. Just kind of makes sense. So addressing it on this level of not just awareness, but working with the resistance to taking the right steps. That's something really important that I really haven't seen discussed very much. It's more like, well, you should just do those right steps. You know, they're the right steps for you, which I don't find very loving or compassionate. Whereas I think we look at it and say, okay, well, if my body-mind combo is very used to being a certain way, it makes sense that it's not just going to change that way overnight. We have to be very patient and loving in the process. So for me, the work that I do, it does take longer than something that might give you the instant relief. And there are plenty of things to give instant relief, illegal and otherwise. And we need to inquire within our own selves, is this really what I need right now? What am I avoiding? And typically we're avoiding feeling something very intense. So with change comes often intense feelings. And then the mind kicks in and it says, how do I manage these feelings? But it can't. And that's what creates what a lot of people call anxiety. The mind and emotions speak different languages. You can't really use one to monitor the other very well. So then we get even more self-critical. Why can't I do this? Why do I have anxiety now? Right? These things can't be answered from level of mind because mind is the level that created it. 
We need to go beyond that. So being in a safe container, a co-created healing space, for example, me working with someone, not only can I really clearly hear slash see what's going on with someone, if I'm really holding space, I'm going to invite that person to feel what's true for them as well. Because in some ways, it doesn't matter what I say. It matters much more what that person feels. And if I can create a loving space for that person to go beyond what's familiar, and even through the discomfort, there's always clarity, freedom, and healing on the other side of it. Whereas the mind often gets, I need to figure this out. I need to, if I only know what's creating my anxiousness, I'll know what to do. Right, which makes sense from a Western perspective. However, it's the last thing that's going to be helpful from a holistic healing perspective because the mind can't give you the answer. In fact, the mind will give you an answer that's the wrong answer because it doesn't want you to experience the deep pains that you've already experienced but have buried from your various traumas. So in that safe container, a lot of people can really feel and say, oh, wow, I am holding grief from someone. And it's part of why I've been diagnosed with depression. This makes sense. It makes so much sense. I think if you really step outside the physical only paradigm. Right. The complexities are just amazing. Absolutely amazing, really, to ponder. And I'm wondering now, too, Dave, I had mentioned there were the two parts about the, the healing, what has already been taken on, and then that other part. What can people do to help manage the now and moving forward? And, you know, what I hear all the time, and I've even said this as well, boundaries and things like that. I feel like that's just such a number one, kind of a surface answer. And number two, the next question then is, well, what do you mean by boundaries? How do I even do that? And then I think that there's just a lack of uh, support it's just not talked about enough, I don't think. So if you could help us understand that part of this, how do we help ourselves uh, from taking on anything else while we're doing the healing work at the same time? Absolutely. I like to think of it like a garden. You can't just pull out weeds. You can't just plant seeds. You got to do both to have a good garden, a healthy garden. Not too different. We need to heal what we've absorbed, but also prevent new information, energy from coming in and landing. So we don't have enough time to do the whole process, but I'll talk about it real, real brief here. So uh, I call it the keyhole, and it's the opposite of what most of us have taught. So I mentioned earlier, putting up boundaries. Boundaries to me, it can be a lot of different things, but to me, it's verbalizing what's true for you. If we're putting up walls, Again, I get it, and on occasion, not a horrible thing. But if that becomes our go-to, then we're really separating ourselves from really how we want to live, to be truly connected with others, to be in a loving, co-created, inspired place with others. And also to be able to hear our own intuition and guidance for putting up a bunch of walls from other people, I really found that can minimize our own internal guidance as well. So what I was shown was the exact opposite, as opposed to walling, was to actually open. So there's four steps all kind of combined into this one process. But the idea is that we open to whatever's coming in, we filter it once it's in the body, and then we release what's not yours or meant for you through the back of the body. So it's a very open, loving, compassionate place. The advantage of that to me is we can still feel what other people are feeling because that's what creates compassion, that's what creates connection, and that's a lot of us, a lot of us, what we kind of thrive on. Some of us get paid for it, in fact. So to close off to that doesn't really make a lot of sense. Now I understand, and we, there's plenty of experiences where you need to close off, like a war zone, for, for example. There's not a lot of time for processing your sadness of losing a comrade if you're fighting somewhere. But unfortunately, that creates a lot of walls, which creates a lot of problems later on. People can't really access the emotions, or if they can, it's just too scary, and understandably. So in the ideal world, we allow whatever is coming in to come in and experience it for even a microsecond to create the connection, right? To be able to feel what someone else is feeling is a gift, but to hold on to it is where it becomes the burden. So we take it in for a microsecond or whatever it takes. We look at it, we breathe with it. There's different things to do, tapping, visualizations, and breath, and et cetera. 
again, we don't really have a full amount of time for, but just the idea of opening to life to me just makes more sense than closing to life. And if you do it well, you won't be overwhelmed. You'll literally take in what's meant for you because your own guidance, again, can be there or the information of what the person's feeling or experiencing. We all have those moments where you say to someone, how you doing? They say, fine, but you know they're not, mm -hmm. right? It's just kind of a nicety, I guess. But to know that, to feel that allows you to create a safe and loving space for that other person, should you choose to. So part of this is an empowerment process that says, if this is what I choose in this moment, I can do it. So what I found is by using this process over and over until it gets into the body, you can hold space or be in the presence of anyone, no matter how annoying you might initially find them or difficult or challenging or whatever word you want to use and still be there. And that's where the growth is, right? There's not a lot of growth going to, you know, Tibet and meditating on a mountain. I mean, it's, it's good. You know, it has its place, of course. And if that's part of your path, I can, I can't say don't do that, but I can also say, is it running from your problems? Mm -hmm. Sure. We do our own versions of running from problems, right? Some people drink alcohol. Some people get lost online. Some people get addicted to food. Some people become the wounded healer or expand upon their presence of a wounded healer within themselves already. There's so many ways that we can sort of check out from feelings. And yet the feelings are already there. So if we can open to what's coming our way, be in the flow of life. I mean, I, I invite everyone listening to this just to feel into that possibility for a moment. What feels more open or what feels more healing and healthy? Closing off from a place of fear. Imagine that for a moment. We've probably all done it and understandably. What if we can bring new awareness to the situation? Be in the presence of love and compassion. Be in a place of personal empowerment, knowing I don't need to take anything on from this person. It's not my job. It's not my responsibility, even though in the past I may have learned that it was. So it's a really big shift in our life experience with a very profound shift in our, well, I should go back in that. It's a, it's a profound shift in our awareness, creating a profound shift in our experience. And I think that's what a lot of us are looking for. Absolutely. That was a great explanation. Um, incredibly helpful information. I feel that much of our listening audience probably wonders if they are empaths or highly sensitive individuals, or they know they are. <laughs> There's a whole spectrum. Can you maybe share a little bit for our audience and for us? Are there, are there any ways to tell if you're an empath or a highly sensitive individual? And are they the same? And if they're not, what's the difference? Great question. Uh, I'm asked that question often. I'm sure. And I will try to make it as simple as possible because I really don't think it's necessary to get too in depth with it. If you walk into a room with other people in it and you feel different than you did before, you're an empath. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's easy. <laughs> More specifically, you can be a highly sensitive person, which it's pretty literal. I'm sensitive to thoughts, people, feeling, emotions, situations, etc. Great. Let's work with that. The next step is the empath and the unskilled empath, typically, before they read my book and work with me, at least. They're taking the sensitivity and then using their own sort of over-responsibility and sponge-like tendency to take it on and keep it. Sometimes the simple answers are the best. And interesting, I have a lot of people that reach out sometimes when the first thing they say is, I'm a bit of a skeptic. And I say, great. <laughs> <laughs> I don't try to change anyone's opinion because words don't matter at that point. But if I can take them through a process, if they're reaching out, typically they're willing to go through a process or two and they can feel something different. So for example, if I take someone through the process like we used earlier of giving anger back to your father, if you feel better in a few minutes, it's pretty much a given that you're an empath and so far an unskilled empath, right? So there's not a lot of room for doubt there. So the skeptic is usually quieted in that moment. <laughs> and being a former major skeptic, I can relate. So who am I to judge their, you know, I'm, I'm just appreciative that they voice it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Fortunately, or whatever adverb you want to use, most people that come to me have a good idea they're, they're empathic already. But if you don't, it's okay. 
just use this guideline. There are probably hundreds, if not thousands of quizzes you could find online where you can just say, do I feel different around some people than I feel around others? Odds are pretty high. You're highly sensitive. If they walk away saying, oh, that person, wow, how great. That Kathleen, what a, <laughs> what a powerhouse. I love being around her. And then, you, and then you're in that situation like... I need to take a nap now. <laughs> exactly. Then you know you're an unskilled empath. Right? <laughs> and the other part is, if it just feels right, sometimes just hearing information is going to resonate. And like you said, a lot of people listening might have that, you know, aha moment or what we called earlier, the empathic awakening just means, yes. oh, okay, maybe this is, maybe there is something to this. Let me try it. What do I got to lose? It's awesome. Yeah. I'm wondering too, Dave, is there forgiveness? You know, that's a big topic for people, I think. How does forgiveness fit into what you do with people? Is it part of the process? Do they have to be willing to forgive? I just think that forgiveness means different things to different people. It's easier for some people to reach forgiveness, but is that part of the process? Is it a requirement? What are your thoughts on that? Well, depending on the situation, right? So if someone comes in and they're holding anger at their father, again, just an example, unfortunately a common example, but it is what it is. It makes sense that there's going to need to be some forgiveness work, right? So if I'm holding my muscles super tight in place of fear because of this or whatever it is, it just makes sense that that's going to be part of it. What I would invite people to really look at is how we're taught and what we're taught about the concept of forgiveness. We're typically taught it's a very mental process to understand they did the best they could. So why do I need to be angry? And I get that, but it's also avoiding the feelings. The inner child is angry. He, she, they need to feel and experience their anger. To me, forgiveness is an emotional, visceral, energetic process and i'll share with you and this is not meant as a disrespect and i've worked with or listening but a lot of times we think we've forgiven someone and we really haven't and the way you know is if you're engaged with someone romantic or otherwise doesn't matter and they trigger something within you and you're smart enough to realize oh they're just triggering something within me it's not necessarily that person that is the problem here and you're willing to go back in your own life and say, where else did I experience a similar feeling? Odds are very high that I was with one or both parents or some other authority figure in the past, which shows me you haven't really forgiven your parents because the trigger is creating an energetic and emotional response. But a lot of times we kind of just avoid, right? Especially lately, it's the, the advent of computers and the internet. I know I'm speaking to people over 50, I imagine everyone else kind of grew up with it, but you get the idea. <laughs> it's so easy to isolate and create our own little world, right? Now, social media thrives on this. And when that happens, we tend to push away people that annoy us, as opposed to saying, mm -hmm. wow, this is a potential gift. What's actually here for me? What is it that they're doing that feels annoying? What is it that they're bringing up that I need to heal? But I might have thought that I'd forgiven because someone told me a forgiveness is a mental state. So taking someone beyond mind, again, to me, is one of the most important things you can do for most types of healing, but certainly with forgiveness. So yes, absolutely. It's a huge part of the process. Yeah, thank you for that. And that makes perfect sense. It really does. And you make a very good point about the odds are very high that we may need to forgive one or both of our parents. You know, the inner child is asking for that, imploring, begging, demanding, whatever. Yeah, I, I get that. I really do. I think we can all remember episodes from our childhood where uh, something our parents said or did or still triggers today. I know I can. Yeah, sure. Even though I have a very good relationship with my parents. My dad is deceased, but my mom is not. And but still, you know, I mean, no one has a perfect childhood, right? I mean, our parents are people, they're flawed, and they are going to make mistakes. All parents do. So, but realizing that, I go back to that awareness. That's, that's what's important. You're involved with someone and they say something and you feel that 
emotion pop in, that feeling, that trigger. Okay, where did I feel that before? That's great advice. I mean, that's so helpful. Thank you. And I think it's also important to point out, this is very different from healing things that have been absorbed. This is your Mm -hmm. own stuff. Your own stuff requires a very different set of tools. Mm -hmm. Tools that I intuited for that, in my experience, are very different from certainly what I grew up or even learned in my metaphysical journey. A lot of times it was, like like I mentioned, a mental process. But sometimes the inner child needs to express, I would say, oh, if not always, uh, minimum often needs to express what's true for them and they need a safe container to do that so there's some of that work that i do as well it's very different and that's a way of actually integrating the anger rather than trying to get rid of it let me toss this your way for a moment i've learned to get rid of things was the way to heal and it makes sense i have a back pain i want to get rid of it sure what you're doing is getting rid of the opportunity for deep healing by pursuing the I want to get rid of this mindset. Whereas if we look at it and say, okay, given my circumstance, my anger is probably very justified. And it doesn't mean I want to go express that at a parent or whoever. That typically doesn't work. But I also don't want to repress it within myself. That creates blockages. A lot of pain and illness come from that. But how do I integrate and allow that inner child to have their experience? So reparenting our own inner child is a really big part of deep healing as well. Giving them time and space to be, say, do whatever they need to. And sometimes you try to connect with them. They don't even want to, they're just, you know, arms crossed. No. And the natural reaction to that is a bit of resistance, perhaps. Like, I need to connect with you, so I'm going to make you open your arms, you know, as an example, and think about it on the physical level with that analogy, that's not going to work either. So I tell people often, like, if they're hiding under the bed, let them hide under the bed, but just be next to the bed in a place of love, eventually they're going to come out. And then it's not even about talking to inner child. This is another part where I find, I don't know, say not as effective as others, where we're just talking to the inner child. Some children are preverbal. We're really understanding the concept that you're trying to, you know, it's like asking a crying baby, what are you crying about? Let's work with that. They're, <laughs> they don't want that. They want validation and safety and security. So it's normal. You hold a small child who's crying. They feel safe. They stop crying. In our own world, we can go in and say, why was I crying as a kid? It could be any number of reasons, but I've also found it's the abandonment that happens on so many levels when we're first born. I have a whole seven-week course on that called Healing the Original Wound, where we work with that sense of abandonment. And it's not just the obvious. There's a lot of other places where it affects us. And it makes sense that that's going to affect everything we do in our lives. We stay in relationships sometimes that we know is not good for us because we don't want to feel abandoned or we don't want to abandon the other person because we know how much that hurts. So that's a very deep, very powerful and profound wound that when worked with very lovingly and very compassionately has an extremely wide range of benefits. If that resonates, uh, if anyone wants to look at the website for that, that's a really good idea. And that's in addition to everything else we've spoken about. So I guess it's a nice way of saying that there's a pretty vast toolbox here. Mm-hmm. And sometimes you might not know which one to use, and I get that. And the mind will typically tell you to use the one that's least effective because it wants what's familiar, like we mentioned earlier. So working to go beyond mind, to feel in, ideally in a safe container, is going to get you the best answers. And then we can work with that head on. And I think we can make some real transformation. Not about getting rid of. We can't get rid of anything. That's the illusion to me. Can't get rid of your fear. Can't get rid of your anger but we can integrate them. We can't get rid of anything. Why? Because we are everything. We have the same potential to be angry as we do to be loving. And this is the part where I found a lot of the new age world misses the mark. It doesn't recognize what some call the shadow self. And I don't want to diss on new age. I I really believe I learned a lot from that. I think a lot of people have, but that doesn't mean that we can't expand upon it. Like anything, I think we always want to grow. The expansion to me is, wow, I do have this part of me that some call shadow. 
I did a reading for someone once who had a lot of tight muscles. I wanted to make sure. So I did the reading. I didn't want to just kind of guess. And I felt there was a lot of anger in her body. And I said, you know, you have a lot of anger in your body, right? And she looked at me and just turned her head softly and said, oh, I don't do anger. Oh, oh. And my reaction was, but it's doing you. Mm-hmm. It was a pretty profound moment for both of us, I think. Yeah. yeah. Because it brings an awareness to something that she had buried, and understandably. So here's the thing. We don't want to judge someone for having buried their anger. I think we've all done that at some point. Mm -hmm. Can't judge what we're doing ourselves. It's not going to go anywhere. But can we hold space for that anger? Can we name it? Can we recognize it? Can we even process it and integrate it rather than try to get rid of it? Because we all have it. And if you can't get rid of anything, if it's part of you, Right? But we can sort of learn to accentuate those non-shadow parts, sometimes by going through the shadow parts. So there's a lot here, and there's a lot in healing that I don't feel is commonly spoken about, and understandably, again, no judgment. For some, there's so much anger there that it's the proverbial Pandora's box. And then they hear that something like that, they want to flip the box open and jump in. I do not suggest that. I suggest opening the box a tiny bit and peeking in until it feels safe enough to open it a tiny bit more. Sure. And this is one of the reasons why the work takes a little bit longer than the instant relief things that were promised, which are, again, everywhere. But it's working on a causal level. It's transforming rather than trying to get rid of. It's healing and getting to a place of wholeness, which I think is what we really want. We call it different things. And it's an invitation to look at these blockages as messages. I think if we can remember these few things that just came out of me, I think we're going to have a much better chance at truly healing, getting to the next level, whatever that looks like for you. I'm kind of dumbstruck, which is not usual for me. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I've just had a master class in how to be an empath. <laughs> <laughs> truly, thank you so much. Yeah. And I want to take a moment and invite our listeners to your website. You have a variety of resources for them there on your website, and you keep it up to date with all of your offerings, current and upcoming, and they can opt in to be in the loop, so to speak. Stay in the know for what you've got there, Dave. The website is davemarkowitz.com. We'll have links in the show notes and the description on YouTube as well so that people can contact you. And I just, wow, want to thank you for joining us for the show and everything that you shared. Really an invitation to go, to go deep and to make some discoveries, I think, for people in their own lives and just invaluable. Thank you. Thank you. So much to learn, and you've shared so much. And that whole concept of awareness, you drove that home very, very effectively. And thank you for being here. We really appreciate your time. Of course. Thanks to both of you and to everyone listening. Thanks for listening. We thank you again for joining us. And of course, we invite you to join us next time as we journey beyond the Reiki Gateway with Kathleen Johnson and Andrea Kennedy.